Did you just see that? I swear to God, that cup of coffee just moved. Huh. I guess I must be seeing things. Wait a minute. Good evening. Prop Hunt is one of the simplest joys that the internet has to offer. Whether it's hopping on for a quick fun game with your friends, or just watching your favorite internet celebrities on YouTube hold back their laughter in a precarious position, Prop Hunt has captivated tens, maybe even hundreds of millions of people over the last 15 or so years. It's become a staple of online gaming, and long since graduated from a funny gimmick minigame on Gmod and Roblox, to an undeniable cultural phenomenon. You know how it goes. One team are the hiders, who disguise themselves as random objects and try to hide from the other team, the hunters, who are humans armed with guns and explosives instructed to find and eliminate them. If the hunters kill all the hiders before the time runs up, they win. If not, they lose. What results is a thrilling stealth experience that can be just as tense as it is comical, filled with clever japes and funny strategies that simply couldn't exist in any other context. Are you a bicycle? This is <laughs> Rarely has a minigame trend like Prop Hunt retained such popularity and relevance for so long. You'd think it would have gotten old by now. I mean, I remember playing this game when I was six or seven years old, yet now I'm coming up on 21, and across its many forms, this game mode still continues to fuel countless memories and viral funny moments year after year after year. Even to this day, it remains popular with both old-timey nostalgic people like me and skibbity ban ban iPad kids alike. And I think it's safe to say it's become a bit of an icon of internet pop culture at this point. But have you ever stopped to ask yourself, how did we get here? Before every popular modern multiplayer game had a mode about hiding from hunters as paint buckets and traffic cones, how did people get their fix for these sneaky shenanigans? And where did this bizarre concept even come from in the first place? For myself, and I would wager a lot of viewers, Prop Hunt has kind of just been a constant online for as long as we can remember. But as it turns out, it does have a history. A very long one, in fact. One with many twists and mysteries, and one that I find quite fascinating. So why don't we have a look and see if we can figure out just how exactly Prop Hunt took over the internet. But first, a word from this video's sponsor. Watching Netflix without ExpressVPN is sort of like playing TF2, but limiting yourself to only playing half the classes. Who in their right mind would want to do a thing like that? See, Netflix blocks content based on what country you live in, which I've always found kind of confusing. Luckily, however, ExpressVPN lets you get around this. It allows you to switch where you want Netflix or other streaming websites to think you're connecting to their service from, and gain access to all that juicy region-locked content. For example, I've been recently watching Hell's Kitchen, which is apparently only supposed to be available in Singapore for some reason. All I had to do to access it was just open the app, select Singapore, tap one button to connect, and then when I refreshed the page, it was there. Additionally, ExpressVPN has a few other advantages over other VPN services. It works on all kinds of devices, from PCs and laptops to phones and even smart TVs. It's super fast, letting you stream HD videos with no buffering, and it's got servers in 94 different countries, making sure you'll never be locked out of watching your favorite weird anime ever again. So be smart. Stop paying full price for streaming services and only getting access to a fraction of their content. Get your money's worth with ExpressVPN and get three extra months free at expressvpn.com slash Richter Overtime. All right, back to the video. To start this journey off right, we're going to have to go all the way back to 1998. Do you remember 1998? I sure as hell don't. I was negative six years old in 1998, and back then the video games industry was similarly infantile. For reference, Half-Life came out in November of that year, and that was pretty much the first immersive first-person shooter game ever made. It was a time long before loot boxes, battle passes, in-game economies, or even physics engines. And seven months before Half-Life, on April 14th, a man named Chris Holden was stricken with inspiration. Quickly cobbling together and releasing a mod for Quake 2 multiplayer by the name of Crate DM. That's right, if you think Half-Life is old enough to be considered a boomer shooter, that means Prop Hunt technically is too. Jokes aside, the story behind Crate DM is pretty novel. Here's how Chris described it in the mod's readme file. One day, I was experimenting with player model plugins while I was working on a new project, and I made a crate player model. Now, this was just for testing, but I laughed my ass off watching it move around the map. I considered the possibility of a deathmatch mode with both players using this crate player model in a map with a lot of crates, so you could stop running and blend in, so to speak. I didn't really see any Quake 2 maps that had the number of crates I was looking for, so I tossed together a single room map. I sent the mod over to a friend, and we played for several hours, having a great time with it. The gameplay was insane. It's just funny to see a crate sliding around the map, and then when you're mid battle, all of a sudden your opponent disappears. It was extremely fun and creepy, so I figured, why not release it? As stated, the mod consisted of just one map called Crate DM1. 
A single room filled with crates with custom code embedded in the map file that turns everyone's character model into crates, leading to sneaky mid-firefight hijinks and ambushes. It was simple, good fun, and the concept wound up being a lot more popular than Chris Holden expected. A lot of early Quake fans still remember Crate DM fondly, and it even wound up being ported over to other games like Quake 3 Arena and even Unreal Tournament in the following years. It's not bad for a mod made in under an hour. But while the concept behind Crate DM was funny and unique, it was pretty simple, and especially given that it only came with one map, it definitely got old after a while. However, as mentioned earlier, another highly moddable FPS game was right around the corner. And in 2001, around three years after Crate DM's release, another modder known online as Planet Sun or Bacon Sandwich, real name Paul Aerith, created his own take on the idea, this time built from Half-Life Deathmatch, dubbed Box War. Here's the tagline. The premise of Box War is as easy as pie. When all the factory workers leave to go home for the night, the crates come out to play. Suddenly, the once work-filled factory floors become deathmatch arenas, as the the crates pick up their weapons and let out their frustration on one another. So, what's so special? Think about it. You're a crate fragging other crates in arenas filled with crates. Stand still and you blend into the scenery. A simple concept, but it's oh so much fun. Funnily enough, Paul seems to claim he actually came up with the idea for Box War completely independent of Crate DM, stating, I got tired of making the same people slash monster player models and turned to more interesting objects like couches, chairs, tables, lamps, etc. I went on a quest into the depths of Worldcraft to seek out a prefab that would be best and easiest to use as a player model. The answer? The Crate. Unfortunately, I was only able to get the Box War mod to launch using the original release version of Half-Life from the 90s, not via either version of the game currently hosted on Steam, so I'm sorry if the graphics settings and the footage look a little weird. Once I did get it up and running, though, I did find it to be pretty charming. It's a lot more fleshed out than the original Crate DM project. For one, it's technically a standalone game with its own really funny-looking menu, and for two, it's got a lot more content to chew on. It comes with six maps as opposed to Crate DM's one, as well as light, medium, and heavy classes called Captain Oak, Chip, and Speed. McPly. On a gameplay level, it's not too different from Crate DM outside of being built from Half-Life instead of Quake 2, but it does have a pretty funny set of weapons. Like this freakish pump action double barrel shotgun, and in place of the ankle biting snarks from the original Half-Life deathmatch mode, termites. Get it? Because everyone's playing as wooden boxes? I thought it was cute. Online bloggers of the time noted just how tense box war could get. Do you dare move? Was that crate there the last time you looked? It's really rather eerie to see the boxes gliding around the rooms and hiding. Now I know some of you by now are thinking, Richter, isn't this video about prop hunt? What's up with this dumb crate box 1998 poop shit? Well, while it might have been a rough start, these two early mods are important to mention, because they almost certainly helped lay the foundation for the strategic and deceptive gameplay later seen in Hide and Seek. In 2004, Valve released Counter-Strike Source, and this game's community quickly gave rise to one of the most legendary PC game modding scenes of all time. Not only were the custom weapons and maps that were made for this game completely balls to the wall insane, but tons of iconic game modes like Jailbreak, Surf, and Gun Game were all either created for or otherwise heavily rooted in the Counter-Strike Source modding scene. And hell, even Left 4 Dead technically started as a Counter-Strike Source mod. However, for the sake of this video, we're going to be honing in on only one of these cool game modes that spawned from CSS. I'm talking about a bizarre somewhat obscure script mod simply called Hide and Seek. This game mode took the concept of hiding among the scenery in an FPS map from Box War and Crate DM and expanded it beyond crates to allow players to hide as any object they could find on the map. It also took advantage of Counter-Strike's team-oriented gameplay by introducing the hunter versus hider dynamic, stripping weapons from the hiders and blindfolding the hunters at the start of the round to give hiders time to find a good spot. And to prevent hunters from just spraying down every room in the map, the server would also hit them with damage penalties anytime they fired a shot at a wall or a non-player prop. This at least from what I can tell, was the first ever iteration of what we now know today as Prop Hunt. Now, unfortunately, even after digging through countless form archives, I still can't find an exact date for Hide and Seek's initial release. The earliest video I can find of it on YouTube was posted on April 14th, 2007, but it's definitely older than that though, since everywhere online seems to say that by 2007, the plugin had already been updated to version 10. Unfortunately, it's been shockingly hard for me to track down the original 1.0 release or the name of the original Hide and Seek script creator. I spent a good while running dead forum links listed in old YouTube videos through the internet archive and scouring them for hints, but I didn't find much other than this deprecated page that credits the script to a person named Mitsudigi. The only other traces I could find of a Mitsudigi online were a PSN hacks page abandoned in 2007, and a Hotmail address that I sent an email to but got no reply out of. However, another archive page my friend Fogardo found, as well as this game banana listing of Hide and Seek 13.5, both write that the original mod was made by a guy named Kevin, who then apparently promptly abandoned it, leaving another user named Typhoon West to take over the mod for a period of time and save it from 
death. So unfortunately, it seems like arguably the most important person in Prop Hunt history, the person responsible for taking the deceptive crate DM formula and turning it into what it is today, is ambiguously credited as a guy named Kevin, who may or may not have also gone by the name Mitsudigi 17 years ago, before seemingly leaving the internet forever. Seeing how big this hunters versus props concept went on to become, and how much of a culture and even industry it later helped build, I can't help but feel a little sad about that fact. So if anyone watching thinks they can find a better lead on who this Kevin guy is, let me know if you find anything in the comments below. It'd be fascinating to know what he thinks of just how far his idea has spread nowadays. Anyways, if you boot up Counter-Strike Source, you'll see that Hide and Seek is just about completely dead nowadays, but for good reason. Counter-Strike Source was never really intended as a modding platform in the way that Half-Life and Quake were, and it seems like a lot of upkeep was required required to even keep it running as the game continued to receive engine updates. In other words, this captivating idea was definitely being held back by the limitations of the game it was made for, and it was kind of in desperate need of a new home. Luckily, however, right around the time Hide and Seek started picking up steam, another Source Engine game called Gary's Mod had begun emerging, which not only prioritized community-made content, but also took advantage of a highly flexible programming language called Lua, making it a much more ideal platform for writing and maintaining custom game modes. Thus, a remake of Hide and Seek for Gmod created by a user named AMT, or Andrew Theus, was released on September 15th, 2007, this time titled Prop Hunt. As far as I can tell, this remake of Hide and Seek is where the name Prop Hunt actually originates from. Thanks to Gmod's aforementioned Lua support, this new Prop Hunt project ran much better than the CSS Hide and Seek game mode, and also had newfangled features that could have never been properly implemented in the Counter-Strike version, such as auto balance and an actual proper HUD. Because of this overall much better playing experience, Gmod quickly became the place to enjoy Prop Hunt. You can find videos of people playing it on YouTube as far back as 2007. As it turns out, living toilets have been a part of Gmod culture long before the advent of Skibbity Toilet. In October 2010, Prop Hunt apparently even wound up being added as an official game mode in Gary's Mod for a short period, alongside TTT, Ascension, and Dogfight Arcade Assault. By the time the big Gmod 13 update rolled around in 2012, though, all of these had been removed other than TTT. It wound up not mattering, however, as Prop Hunt still remained massively popular in the game's community, eventually becoming the most subscribed Gmod add-on of all time on the Steam Workshop. And it's not even close, either. At the time of me recording this, Prop Hunt has over 6 million subscribers, while the second place add-on, Star Wars lightsabers has only 3 million. Prop Hunt is king by a very, very wide margin. And it's actually not far-fetched to say a lot of people probably bought Gary's mod just to play Prop Hunt. Anyways, by this point word was getting out about this nifty new sneaky game mode, and that it started piquing people's interest outside the Gmod community. On October 22nd, 2009, a user named Dark Immortal released a port of the game mode to TF2, helping bring it to an even wider audience. In this version, the blue team are all hunters in the form of pyros, while the red team are all props as scouts. Now, I don't mean to be overly negative, or put down the people who created and played this version back in the day, but I personally never thought TF2 Prop Hunt was any good. It's very limited by the game it's in, even more so than the Counter-Strike Source Hide and Seek mode in my opinion. Unlike Gmod, which was basically built for custom shenanigans like this, TF2 Prop Hunt feels like it's being held together by chicken wire. And in my experience, most matches revolve around props just trying to clip into objects and become basically invisible. Because frankly, in TF2 the props are so fucking massive that there's just not a lot of good hiding spots. The jank has always been part of the fun of Prop Hunt though, and in a new more colorful game, Prop Hunt immediately became an even bigger hit, with many games journalist sites running articles about this new, fun TF2 experience. And just like Gmod, Prop Hunt wound up being somewhat officially supported in TF2 as well, with multiple official updates pushing features and fixes directly intended for the community developers of the custom Prop Hunt mode to take advantage of. By this point, there were now three different popular Valve games hosting their own versions of Prop Hunt, and things were definitely starting to heat up for the game mode. A very popular Roblox version by a guy named Maximum ADHD was also released in March 2010. And it was in the following two or three years that Prop Hunt started really going viral. In 2011 and 2012, two things happened that helped lead to a huge boom of interest in Prop Hunt content on YouTube. For one, the Gmod 13 update came out, making the game less prone to crashes, brighter and more colorful looking, and overall more accessible. This led to a massive wave of new players checking out Gmod and all of the wacky things it had to offer, including Prop Hunt. For two, Team Fortress 2 went free to play. Up until this point, the game was sold on Steam for around $20, but now anyone with a computer and a Steam account could join and peruse the game's server browser at their leisure. These two factors led to a massive spike of interest in Prop Hunt. And with YouTube content entering a renaissance around the same time, a culture was born. With these multiple different versions of the game ripe for the picking, Vanoss Gaming, Markiplier, CNanners, PewDiePie, and countless others started having fun in Prop Hunt and broadcasting their japes to millions and millions of their viewers. Before the age of Minecraft SMPs, we had these guys yelling and expanding into a web of funny guys gaming on the internet for fun. And back then, it almost felt like an infinite supply of content. Tons of videos came out in this era showcasing funny moments and clever strategies. 
The combination of humor, creativity, and the deceptive nature of Prop Hunt made it a very engaging choice of game for YouTubers. This is also probably a good time to mention taunts. Taunts were a big part of Prop Hunt back in the day. Basically, every minute or so, the props would emanate a noise to help hunters find people who had been hiding in an unfair or glitched spot. I'm not really sure when, but at some point this evolved into a system where props could choose what sound they'd play from a list, and even play them at will if they wanted. What emerged was a culture of running around and spouting memes at hunters while narrowly avoiding their wrath. And it was massively entertaining at times. <laughs> Of course, when something is good, people tend to copy it. And by the mid-2010s, the amount of eyes Prop Hunt was catching online made people outside the Valve community realize just how much of a demand there was for silly shenanigans like this. And thus, Prop Hunt grew wings. One of the first major companies to embrace Prop Hunt outside of Valve was Activision. On March 31st, 2017, Call of Duty Modern Warfare Remastered was updated with the addition of a new Prop Hunt mode for the first time in the series. And it was actually very interesting. I personally will always be most fond of the Gmod version, but I can't deny the charm that Call of Duty Prop Hunt carries. There's just something really interesting about seeing this weird Frankenstein game mode with roots in a 1998 Quake mod, officially adapted in a AAA gritty serious military console shooter. How far we've come. Just a few months later, in May 2017, Arcane Studios released an FPS stealth game called Prey, with mechanics very much reminiscent of Prop Hunt. The main enemies in the game are called Mimics, and they're opponents with the special ability to turn into any object in the game on a whim. Later on, you get the ability to scan objects to determine if they're Mimics or real objects, and you eventually even unlock the mimic ability yourself, with the game letting you copy any item in the world and opening up all kinds of opportunities to explore, find new secrets, and glitch out of bounds. It's neat. In 2018, they also released a multiplayer spin-off called Prey Typhon Hunter that was basically a full-on imitation of actual prop hunt, but was not received very well by the community. I've actually not played Prey myself, but the original game has incredibly good reviews and seems to be an undeniable cult classic, so it's probably worth checking out sometime if prop hunt in space sounds like an interesting premise to you. Get in the helicopter on the roof. Just go ahead and uh, get inside this. What? I I died. I, I and I got an achievement. Over the years, there have also been a few other projects that have tried building standalone indie games based on Prop Hunt and posting them on Steam or various mobile game stores. Now, in theory, this could be cool, and I understand where the impulse comes from. All the versions of Prop Hunt we've covered so far have been created by mutating other games and are thus kind of flawed. They've got exploits and other imperfections that sometimes detract from the experience. So I can see why people would think there was room on the market for a more refined product. Being available on mobile also obviously opens Prop Hunt to a larger market of younger people as well. The thing is, in my opinion, most of these just kind of look boring. There was some real personality to the props in Counter-Strike, Gmod, and TF2. Running away from a guy as the fucking Hypnotoad or a bunch of bananas was funny. This... This just looks kinda lame. It seems to me like a big part of the charm of Prop Hunt lies in its transformative and janky nature. And while I haven't spent a whole lot of time playing Prop Knight or any of these other spinoffs, I feel like the reviews tell me all I need to know about them. Speaking of reviews, back in 2023, everybody's favorite game Overwatch added its own prop hunt game mode called Mischief and Magic. I don't play Overwatch, I never really cared to check it out to be honest, and apparently the guys who make it also do no good, bad, nasty stuff in their office or something. But I do have some friends who are into the game and they tell me that this mode is actually pretty fun, and one of the better things they've added in this game in the last few years. From what I hear, every 10 or 15 seconds the props make a noise to alert the hunters, akin to the taunts in Gmod, and they also get grenades or flashbangs to stun them for a quick getaway, which sounds like a probably leads to some pretty entertaining Looney Tune shenanigans. Oh, and the Fortnite. Of course they put this shit in Fortnite. In the last few years, Fortnite has been trying to expand to host other kinds of game content in a way similar to Roblox. And of course, one of the game modes they've jacked is Prop Hunt. From what I've played, it takes the player to a small map and sets things up just about how you'd expect. Though the team of hunters are handled a little differently. The damage system in place to punish hunters from just shooting everything isn't present. Instead, the hunters are limited by their weapon. A single shot shotgun with a slow firing rate. It does seem to insta-kill the hiders though, who once again occasionally emanate sounds to help give away their position. Basically, if you're a hide or you hide, and if you're a hunter, you just run around and shoot everything that moves or seems out of place. I played this one map themed around the house from Home Alone, and there were RC cars and shit on the ground that seriously confused me for a second. Now, I know the audience I've cultivated on my channel is probably not big fans of Overwatch or Fortnite, and I'm not either, but I think it's important to mention them in this video to show just how far this idea has come. The flavor of the month minigame culture birthed by early custom game modes like Prop Hunt has now evolved into the modern live service standard of AAA video games. Custom game modes have been adopted and turned into official content because nowadays, games need to have a revolving door of content in order to stay relevant in a modern social media landscape. And while in some ways the commercialization of this once organic phenomenon 
one is sad. I for one am glad that this beloved minigame continues to live on and bring people joy. When I look at the journey that Prop Hunt has gone through in Rising to the Top, I can't help but notice the parallel its story has with that of the Source engine itself. It all started with a simple mutation of Quake, then evolving into its own more interesting identity, then with the technological jump in video games from the early 2000s, something truly great was born, and then promptly served on a golden platter throughout online pop culture via Gmod and TF2 in the early 2010s, still echoing to this very day. Playing a match of Prop Hunt with my friends never fails to take me back to my younger years. Holding back laughter in the same way you would when your friend makes a silly face at you from across class while the teacher is in a bad mood, it's a reminder that the best, most earnest joy is usually the simplest. As of today, Crate DM is 26 years old, and it's fascinating to me that the fruits of its labor are still creating laughs and smiles a quarter century later. So, here's to Prop Hunt. If you want to talk more about its history or your favorite version, join my Discord in the description and tag me and call me a poopy head. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed. Shout out to this article by Robert Yang on the Radiator Design blog that included some really good info on Crate DM and Box War and partly inspired me to make this video. And have a good day. Mess of things without you here, oh yeah.